Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to be digging in a little bit deeper into our last build. This here is a 1956 Heister YE40 forklift that I did a resto mod conversion on. I'm calling it a resto mod because I did a pretty decent restoration from front to back on it, but I made a few modifications along the way, mainly converting the original power plant to a hydraulically driven unit. So instead of having the original engine right here driving our transmission, the hydraulic motor right there does all of the work. In order to power that hydraulic motor, we have a 420 cc air-cooled Harbor Freight engine. It's actually made by Predator, but everyone calls them Harbor Freight because that's where they are sold. I've got, let's see, uh, about 9.2 hours on the hour meter right now. So I've got a decent amount of time to figure out kind of what worked, what didn't work with this whole project. So I wanted to go over all of that with you. I'll do that once I get this back into the shop. Right now, what I wanted to show you is how it actually works as a forklift, lifting up big heavy equipment, because that is mainly what I use it for, moving vehicles like this around the yard. This is a 1952 International L170 truck. I just sold it to a guy in Montana who is coming to pick it up tomorrow, but he is going to be replacing the engine with a 5.9 12 valve Cummins and a 10 speed Eaton manual, which means he doesn't have any need for its current drivetrain, which is a nice little inline six. So I will be pulling out that inline six along with the four speed transmission, sell it to him without the drivetrain. I'll do something with that engine and transmission in the future. Now I do plan on showing you most of the operations of this forklift in real time. So this video might be a little bit slower than what you're used to, but in my time lapse video, it was just too hard to get a good feel for the actual operations of this because I was speeding everything up so much. The hydraulic motor does make it about a quarter of the top speed that it was before, which is absolutely fine by me because it gives you a lot more control. So let's get this thing fired up, get that truck into the shop. All right, so starting off with firing it up, put the key in the on position. It does like the choke to start up, and we'll use the pull start here. installed a throttle cable I find that the lever that's on the engine is a little bit easier to adjust so I lean down get the rpms up a little bit there we go so this is probably at around I don't know 1800 2000 rpm not super high I like to keep it just above idle so that the motor doesn't stall out, but not so much that the motor gets too hot. a little bit farther out on the forks than I would like for it to be, but I need to be able to pivot around. So we'll see how that works out. quite full speed because we're still only at about 1800 rpm and this is probably about halfway towards top speed we are at 1000 psi it goes up to 3000 show you guys the kind of control this thing has.
All right, while I reposition this, I want to show you how the steering indicator works. So I almost forgot, before I pull the engine and drivetrain from this truck, I do want to weigh it. So I've got my scale set up right here. So we'll use the forklift to lift this back up. I'll slide the scale underneath that front axle, drop it down. We'll see how much this front end weighs. Because although this forklift is rated at 5,000 pounds, once you get to 30 inches out here on the forks, which is about where we were lifting from, the capacity then becomes 3,500 pounds. And I could tell we were nearing that, if not exceeding it, because the rear steering was getting a little bit light while we were pulling it in. So let's get this lifted up and weighed. All right guys, well, we've got it on the scale here. We are at 3,504 pounds. So exactly 3,500 pounds right at 30 inches, which is exactly what the rated limit of this forklift is. Just crazy. All right, so I made a list of the pros and cons of this build along with the more frequently asked questions. But before we look into that, I wanted to remind everybody exactly how this forklift operates because it is quite a bit different than it was when it was new. Starting off, we've got ourselves a 420cc single cylinder Predator engine, which then goes to this coupling right in there. And then our hydraulic pump. This is a 13 gallon per minute, 3000 PSI pump. Pressure goes from that pump to the top here. This is the little P labeling on our first spool valve. It then goes through this valve, which is an open centered valve to the tank port, which then goes to the pressure side of another spool valve. This is a three spool valve where it goes through all three of those valves. And then it goes through the tank port right there over to our external filter from that filter back into the factory tank. On this three spool, the first one goes to the motor, the second one goes to our main cylinder lift, and then the third one here goes to our tilt cylinders on the side. We do have a little hydraulic pressure gauge right here, and then as far as our other gauges, we've got a temperature sensor for the engine oil, temperature sensor for the hydraulic oil, voltage meter, and then we've got a little hour meter. We are currently sitting just a little bit over 10 hours. All right, so let's start with the pros. Right now, this is a fully functioning forklift. There's really no major issues that I've got with this. I could probably keep this more or less in its current configuration for the next 15 years or so without any major issues. Once I hit 30 hours, I would go ahead and drain the engine oil. I'll send that out to Blackstone for testing. As long as it looks like that engine is not wearing excessively, they'll put me on a good schedule for how many hours that oil needs to be cycled out. After maybe 100 hours or so, I would take a sampling of the hydraulic oil. I wouldn't drain it. I would just sample it, send it out to them. They would tell me when the first uh, fluid change is due for that. Same thing with the transmission. I'd probably drain the transaxle. Well, I'd probably sample it rather than drain it at about 
maybe 300 hours and then they would again tell me when the uh, time would come to swap that out for the brake fluid i would probably every three to five years just completely flush the system put new brake fluid in there it is uh, dot three that i've got in there now so it will accumulate a little bit of moisture over time and you guys saw what that did to the old wheel cylinders but overall it does function i mean that's the biggest pro everything on here is working there's no major issues let's get to the cons I've got a nice little list here. So starting off, the biggest thing, what do we have? Uh, hose locations. Okay, that was a big issue. Uh, a lot of people complained about me running these hoses in the front. I do have just enough clearance so that when it is fully tilted, it goes up or down and it doesn't really rub against anything. But I don't like it. You guys don't like it. Nobody likes it. So I will be rerouting some of these hoses. Also, somebody brought to my attention that they make high strength hose sleeves. So I looked into that. Those actually look really cool for anywhere where there could be potential rubbing, specifically right over here, because those tilt cylinders do go up and down just a little bit as they're moving back and forth so i will definitely look into that uh the next thing i've got here uh motor cushion okay so they make a valve that sits basically it's a little block that sits right in between the two lines that run to that motor when this motor is going at full speed which is about 900 rpm if you're going downhill like in my front yard where it's nice and sloping down you can build up a little bit of speed and then when you go to slow it down you do hear a little bit of a and there is a pressure build up because there is supposed to be a cushion and all that cushion does is when there's a high pressure buildup on one side it just pushes a little bit of that fluid to the other side uh, almost makes the motor not quite like neutral but it does allow it to coast or maybe uh, freewheel is a good term to just spin it a little bit more without building up too much pressure on that uh, there is a guy who reached out to me he is a uh, much more of a hydraulic expert than i am that was one of his biggest recommendations i will definitely be doing that that should help protect that motor in the future the next thing i've got over here um <laughs> my hydraulic routing the hydraulic routing on this is not correct i told you guys it goes from the pump up to our steering valve and then from the steering valve through the tank port to our secondary spool valve that's not the correct way to do that i believe this is called hooking them up in parallel what i should have done is i should have gone through this end port right here with the power beyond sleeve now i did try a setup similar to that initially when i hooked this up i had all of the fluid going to our main three spool valve and then i had a power beyond sleeve from the neutral port to the steering now, because these are relatively cheap spool valves, I couldn't source the correct power beyond sleeve. So I actually had to machine one myself just so I could get fluid to our steering. The issue that I had when all of the fluid initially went to the three spool valve and then to the steering, what that meant was when I had the motor actuated. So when I'm driving forward like so, all of the fluid was diverted to the motor. So then while I'm driving forward, I would go to steer it and I would have no fluid. And I figured obviously I would rather have steering at the cost of speed versus speed at the cost of steering so that is why i reversed everything but when i reversed it i didn't end up going with a power beyond sleeve because i saw some people online that went through the tank port and then all of the fluid went right into the second spool valve instead of having to have the tank valve hooked up directly to the tank and then the power beyond hooked up to the three spool i thought that that made a lot of sense because it made it one less hose and all of the fluid gets pushed through there which means all of the fluid eventually goes through the filter but again that guy who was telling me about the cushion valve for the hydraulic motor he mentioned that these valves are not designed this way and there is a certain circumstance depending on which valves are open at which time that i can actually crack this case uh, so i should have used that power beyond sleeve now rather than doing it that way he gave me another option that he thought would be better and i agree with him and that is using a flow control valve and basically what the flow control valve will do is it will go from a hydraulic pump to the flow control valve which will push about 10 percent of the fluid it is adjustable so i'm imagining Imagining it'll be around 10%, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less to our steering. And it will have that fluid no matter what, whether it's open or closed. So if it's open and I'm not using it, it'll just go right back into the tank. If it is being used, it'll use that 10%, but never anymore. And then 90% of the fluid will go to our three spool valve. And then I can use that as needed. The nice thing there is that I will always have fluid to my steering and it's not putting too much fluid to it because right now when I am actuating the steering, it is a little bit quick, which leads me to another problem. You see, we've got our shaft right there on our steering. Basically, when the fluid goes into this side, there is a lot less displacement inside that cylinder because some of that area is taken up by this shaft. So it takes less fluid 
to push it in this way than it does when it's filling up the empty cylinder to push it this way. So my steering is a little bit easier to go one direction than the other. In order to uh, fix that, actually, I've already got that part. Let me show you. So this box here is all the fittings that I bought for this forklift that I ended up not needing. Don't tell my wife, but it's probably like $200 in fittings. This is what I want to show you. This is the flow control valve. You adjust this screw at the top and it adjusts the flow in one direction. The other direction is open. You've got a little ball valve right there. I will simply put this on the shaft side of the steering. It'll restrict the flow. I can adjust it to try to match the speed of the other side and we should be good to go. All right, moving on to the next issue, this top lever here, this is what actually lifts the forklift. This is for our main cylinder. You have fluid that goes to the bottom, but there is no return fluid. Basically, it just pushes the fluid in, and then when the valve is pushed forward, the fluid just goes back through the system. The problem is, when it goes forward, it's also trying to push fluid to right there on the bottom where you see I've got that cap. Now, the correct solution for this is to change out the actual shaft in the spool that's in the bottom part right here that goes forward and back, and you actually have to machine away the portion that would normally send power to the capped area, and it just reverts it internally back to the tank. Now, I figured that out uh, kind of on accident. I hooked it up and then it wasn't working, and then I went to my old spool valve here. Let me get this unscrewed so I can show you guys what the difference is on the two shafts between the one that operates our tilt cylinder and the one that operates our main cylinder here. All right, we've got our spool valve taken apart so we can gain access to the spools here. And you see they look more or less the same until you get to right here where this little portion is machined away. And again, that is just so the blocked off B port right here can be redirected internally back to the tank. So I will have to find a way to machine the spools that I currently have to make that work. The last issue that we've got, a lot of people brought this up and I didn't really think about it at the time, the weight. Uh, the engine that we've got now is a little bit less, well, a little bit less is relative. Uh, it's maybe three to 400 pounds less than the original engine. Obviously, forklifts use counterweight. This entire back section is one giant piece of cast iron because you want as much weight back here to offset the weight that you've got at the front. So unlike a car where you're trying to keep weight low, it's the exact opposite. You're trying to keep the weight high. So a lot of the components are overbuilt and very heavy. My best guess is that the original engine was probably three to 400 pounds heavier than what we've got now, which means our lifting capacity is going to be three to 400 pounds less than it was. I had a lot of people tell me that I need to get this forklift recertified for its new lifting capacity, as if I'm going to contact some government agent and have them come out here and look over my forklift and tell me what it can lift. I don't even know what that means. I don't know how you would even get a forklift certified. I imagine... I don't know, OSHA would probably be involved in probably a bunch of nonsense. So I'm not having anybody certify my forklift, but it is something to keep in mind that the lifting capacity is theoretically a little bit lower. Now the counterweight on this, this thing might weigh 10,000 pounds. So it might not be an issue with how much weight I can actually lift in the front. You guys saw me at 30 inches on the front, it could lift 3,504 pounds and it still had steering. So we know that we don't have so little weight on the back that it's not properly steering. So as far as I can tell, the lifting capacity of this is still exactly where it needs to be, but it is something I will keep in mind. I don't think I've ever lifted, well, <laughs> let me back up. I've definitely lifted more than this thing can lift because I've lifted enough to where the back end just comes up and I have no steering. I've done that with the old engine. I've also done that with the new engine, uh, but that was only when I'm moving, like lifting up a vehicle and just kind of testing. Uh, I've never actually like moved product that way. The heaviest thing I've ever lifted with this that I actually had to lift you know, high was the pizza oven that was going in the back of my last pizza truck. And that was, I think, just under 3,000 pounds, maybe around uh, 2,800, uh, probably closer to 3,000 with the table that I made. All right, so let's move on to the most common questions or comments that I got on this build. Really, there were two of them, both on the front end here. The first one, these split rims. I called them Widowmakers. Boy, howdy, did I get a whole bunch of people correcting me. Let me start off by explaining the term Widowmaker just means dangerous. That term is used colloquially through just every industry that I've ever worked in. In the military, in heavy equipment, in mechanics, anything that can kill you, people will nickname the Widowmaker. They'll even call vehicles, like if that truck had no brakes, the nickname for that thing would just be the Widowmaker. If this thing was on sketchy stilts out there, people would call that the Widowmaker. If this uh, backhoe here didn't have a roll cage, people would call that a Widowmaker. So, the term Widowmaker just means dangerous. These are definitely not the most dangerous type of split rims. Actually, I've got on this property, I've got a more dangerous set. Let me show you. 
Back to our very same 1952 International that is getting all kinds of screen time in this little build series. We've got split rims on the front of this. Now these are pretty much the same style where you have a screwdriver in here, you pry this out and this entire ring pops off. The biggest difference between this and the forklift is that the ring is on the outside rather than on the forklift where it's on the inside. So on the forklift, if that ring were to pop off, it would pop off inside and you'd be fine. On this style, if I could get this ring to pop off, then it could do some serious damage to me, even as it's sitting on the vehicle right here. Now, even these aren't the really dangerous type. So if you're interested in split rims and widow makers and all those different types of wheels, I'm sure there's tons of videos that will show you in detail the different ones that lock together in different ways and how some are more dangerous than others. No point in getting into that here, but that was one one of the biggest comments that I got. All right, next up on our frequently asked questions and comments, I got a ton of people that did not like this engine in this forklift. I get it, everything on this forklift for the most part was really nice and really old and overbuilt and cool. And then I went ahead and threw in what people called a lawnmower engine. And I knew that I was gonna bring in some hate, that's fine. If I knew that this system was going to work as well as it does, I probably would have gone with the Honda version of the same thing. I love this engine, but I do think that the Honda is a little bit better. It's a little smaller. I think it's 390 cc's instead of 420. I do think the Honda will last longer, and I do think that it's better built. I didn't know for sure if this was going to work, so I didn't want to throw in the extra $600 for the Honda version. If this one poops out on me prematurely, I will probably do that. If it lasts a long time and I'm getting good sampling from my oil and analysis and everything on it looks good and I might see how long this thing lasts and then moving on to the front of the forklift here we have what made people the most angry and that was removal of my front side shift I told you guys that it wasn't working that wasn't exactly true it did work it was just leaking so bad that I didn't like using it in the two years that I operated this forklift around here there was maybe one time where I should have used the side shift but I actually forgot that I had it and so I didn't even use it then and that was when I was installing the pizza oven in the back of my pizza truck because I had to put that oven exactly where it needed to be. And I'm talking within like half an inch because it was so heavy and there was really no other way to move it. Now I had side shift at the time. It was working. Like I said, it was leaking, but it did work. And I could have used that to just scooch it over a half an inch one way or the other. I completely forgot that I even had it. If I wanted to keep the side shift, I would have had to change my entire hydraulic system. Not only would I have to run hydraulic hydraulic lines to the front cylinders, those hydraulic lines would have to run all the way up, parallel to the chain, all the way back down. I'd have to run them inside where we do not have an extra valve. So I would probably have to remove the motor from this three spool valve, hook it up to this port here. I would have to then do another spool valve on the other side so that it would be controlled forward and reverse on that side or hook up a foot pedal for it. So you're talking about all these extra hoses and fittings and every single hose and every single fitting is another failure point just so I would have side shift, which I've never even cared about not having. Now, if you guys feel differently about side shift, that's fine. It's just not a big deal for me. Guys, I had one more thing on my list that I almost forgot about, and that is our rear tire cover. I did not reinstall it, and that was because the tires that I went with, they're a little bit flatter than the originals, so they're a little bit closer right here, and they were making contact when I slid that cover in. I didn't realize that every single piece of gravel in my yard was going to get stuck in those tires and then rotated around and then deposited right here, like so. Uh, it's driving me absolutely nuts. So I will modify that. I'll put a little bit tighter curve to it so that it hugs up against the steel a little bit better. And then I'll get that reinstalled. And that brings me to, we went over our pros, we went over our cons. What am I actually going to do? So I just told you, we'll fix that back tire cover. No problem there. I am going to reroute the hydraulics because I am worried about the configuration that I've got it set up. As far as I can tell, the guy that I've been uh, working with on the hydraulic system, he is right and I am wrong. This is probably not a good way to do it. So I am going to do a flow control valve. So we're going to steal a little bit of flow from that pump that's gonna to go to the steering at all times. And then I will add that other flow control to the cylinder there so that hopefully I'll have it where when I go right and when I go left, they go at more or less the same speed. It will also slow it down. If you guys notice, I'm doing a lot of this, like where it's like, ink, ink little adjustments. What I would like is if I could just move it this way and then I could watch my little dial go back and forth and it would just be a little bit slower. So the flow control to this and then that means that I'll have to go from the tank back over to right here. 
I have a gauge on the tank inlet, and I realize that that gauge should probably be on my filter where the fluid is going in so that I can watch as the gauge goes up. That means that I've got more resistance inside my filter telling me that my filter is uh, starting to get full of dirt and crud and that it should probably be replaced. So I'll move that uh, gauge over to the correct location. We'll then take the tank port back into the tank there. That will be unfiltered, but it's not the end of the world. Next up, I will remove this valve right here and then I will machine it so that the B port then goes directly to the T port internally so that I can then lower our tilt cylinder without increasing our pressure too much. And then lastly, I think I'm going to paint this heister on the back. I didn't know what color I wanted to paint it. I knew I wanted to paint it. I just didn't know what color. And most of the comments are telling me that I should do all of these letters in this red color. That does make sense to me. We've got the red dashboard there and then we also have the red that's peeking through on our transmission so it does seem like that really is the secondary color so i will go ahead and paint this heister red and see how that looks all right fast forwarding about a week we are all finished up with our upgrades here i didn't film any of it because it was mostly just rerouting hoses it was not very exciting i do have our back panel right here which will hopefully keep the rocks from accumulating inside we've got our flow control valve here i did make a little mount for it that was kind of cool let's go over our current hydraulic configuration before i get this thing fired up and show you how it's working we have our hydraulic pump right here which then goes to our flow control. We have a control flow right here, which then runs up to our steering. I do have protectant sleeves on all of the steering components out here, and we no longer have any hoses on the front. From our steering, it goes back down here where we have our secondary control valve to limit the pressure going this direction. The tank port right here now flows all the way back to the tank. On our main spool valve, we have the pressure coming from our flow control excess port right here, and then it operates as normal. The only real difference on our motor, instead of the hoses going directly into the motor, they now go to our cushion valve, which is right down here. Now, while everything was apart, I went ahead and machined the spool for our main cylinder lift so that I can now drop the forks without building up pressure. So what I want to do before I put these panels on, I'll go ahead and get this fired up so I can show you the steering in action because it is a lot more controllable now that it is slow. And then we'll get the panels on and we'll take this thing outside and I'll show you how the cushion valve is working with our motor. All right, so here we are going to the right and then to the left. You can see it's a lot slower than it used to be. So let me go ahead and get these panels on and then we'll take this thing for a drive. Now there's really no change in the drive speed here, but there is a huge difference in the speed of the steering. You'll notice that I'm able to hold the joystick to the left or the right a lot longer instead of making a bunch of really small abrupt movements with it. It's a lot more natural to use it this way, but it is going to take some getting used to. I probably had about three hours into this forklift before I was really comfortable with it before, and it'll probably take another three hours or so in its current configuration. I'm using the forklift here to pick up some steel for my next project. I'm building another custom pizza truck. Instead of doing an episode series like I did on the last one, I'll probably do the video a lot like the forklift where I do it in one video and just narrate the whole process so you guys kind of know what's going on. As far as that motor cushion goes, I didn't notice a huge difference in drivability. I did notice that the sound that it would make when it would build up a little bit of pressure going over hills was subdued, but really that was installed more for longevity's sake rather than performance, and as long as it's doing its job, that hydraulic motor should last a very long time. All in all, I have to say I'm very happy with all the modifications I made to this forklift. I don't plan on doing anything major to this in the future. Hopefully in its current configuration, it will last a very long time. I did go ahead and paint the embossed heister letters on the back, and like any other paint job, it took twice as long to tape as it did to actually paint. So while you guys are watching me in pure frustration with this tape job, I'd like to recommend a couple other videos to check out once you're done watching this, of course. The first is a wonderful channel called Lucia's Workshop. She is in the process of building a skid steer from scratch. She's five episodes in. It's an absolutely fascinating build. One thing that I really like is that she shows the frustration of building a hydraulic system from scratch, which I can absolutely relate to after doing this build. The other video that I wanted to recommend is Vinny B's latest. I told you guys about Vinny B in the last episode where I was actually building this forklift because he is building a backhoe from scratch to mount on the back of his tractor. Well, his latest episode he builds a fork attachment so now it's not only a backhoe but it's also a forklift so go ahead and check that out i'll put a link to both of those in the description below otherwise that's it thanks for watching take care thanks for watching everybody bye bye